Hello everyone. So I'll, I'll straight get to the uh, chat around the industry. <clears throat> so Dr. Velumani, you know, as we were discussing earlier uh, as well, you know, as, as the industry, the di traditional diagnostic industry as we know it, has historically grown at 20% plus uh, and the whole unorganized to organized shift playing out. <clears throat> has that piece sort of played out already uh, to a large extent in tier one cities? And, you know, as a lot of private equity money comes in backing even the smaller diagnostic uh, players in, in big cities, uh, competitive intensity has sort of gone up uh, and you, we see some realization pressures also coming in. Is, is there any new technology, any disruption, any new avenue of growth, be it on the government side of things, uh, be it, uh, be it on, on the molecular diagnostic side of things, uh, that, that can sort of be the next front of growth here? Uh. Right. Diagnostics industry has been a, a subject of keen interest for uh, investors for the last 10 years. In an industry where uh, truly capex is not needed and a uh, lot of profits are there, plenty of uh, um, private equity participation has taken place. And uh, we have now two listed companies, and a third is uh, on the runway. And uh, these two listed companies uh, were getting a much higher valuation at the time of their uh, IPO surprising to even the players. But then market corrects itself. Today we are trading at the uh, same rate at which we got listed two years back. That means uh, there is a correction. And having said that, uh, even in a corrected PE multiple, it's pretty high. And that makes many people to invest in uh, small and medium players. To my knowledge, uh, Around 100 players have been funded in this country using around 250 million US dollars. All these players have been told very clearly, we want numbers and numbers. So there is a huge, what you call as a bloodbath, and everybody thinks that cutting the price is the only way to grow. And uh, it worked well for me 20 years back because pricings were very high. Today, in the disrupted pricing, cutting the pricing somewhere is only putting the runway cost too high. And plenty of them have given up, according to me. So if you ask me, there is no change in model. Earlier, a lot of B2C model. B2C models find difficult to get volume. B2B model gets volume. But B2B model doesn't have margins. So I think, literally speaking, uh, everyone tries to invest some money and see what is the traction. They reach to around 2,000 samples per day. Things appear to be working. Anything beyond 2,000 samples per day is not working. And some of them have come back to 1,000 samples per day because there at least you make some margin. Technology-wise, nothing much has happened in these last 10 years. Some molecules have helped. Vitamin D was a molecule for the last 10 years for the laboratories, as well as even for our vendors. And some of the molecules uh, have come in the picture, but not as promising as vitamin D. We all will have to wait if there is anything which helps us to grow maybe additional 5-10%. As you said, uh, unorganized market was supposed to have given up in these last 10 years of onslaught by the organized players. But I think there is profit in this diagnostics, either too high volume or in too low volume. And the too volume, low volume guys are stuck with 500 to 1,000 samples, and they are very much going to be there. So if you ask me, like Indian politics, national players will be there, uh, regional players will be there. So, so as, as uh, the industry moves uh, a little bit to the tier two, tier three markets uh, starts going there, right, as tier one is already reasonably penetrated, uh, do you see uh, the B2B model playing out uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in a bigger capacity or, or do you see the B2C model uh, playing out in the, in the smaller markets? 
what, what do you think? Your, your model has worked well uh, in, in the tier two uh, markets where you have been able to draw samples out from even the smaller cities, et cetera, with your central lab. But do you see that playing out uh, even more succinctly going forward uh, with other players also moving to a similar, uh, similar model? Or do you think the way forward there is, is going to be the retail, uh, retail mode? Nothing is very clear which one will be truly ideal to approach. In a B2C model, there is value, there is profit, but there is no volume. And in B2B, it is a lot of volume, very little margins, so there is a challenge there. So the guys who are in B2C think the other bank is green, so they move towards B2B. And the guys who are in B2B will think that there is a value, so let us move that way. And let me honestly tell you, as on today, the guys who run laboratories hardly make money. The guys who run collection centers make a lot of money. Because they are the guys in touch with the customer, and there is 50, 60 percent margins are given to them because of the greed for volume. And that give, has given the control in their hand. And that is another industry which is likely to come up, like what you call as an uh, uh, unbranded ATM. That could be even unbranded collection centers across the country who will collect for anyone. And that is another very interesting business model which I think uh, is likely to succeed because every player cannot have his own ATM. But if there is an ATM, probably every player can use it. So, so as we talk about the new dimensions, etc., molecular diagnostics, genomics, etc., that has emerged... Uh, as uh, as a new wave sort of in in new diagnostics uh, i think uh, the the traditional diagnostics players have still not sort of gone deep into that but uh, anu just to hear from you what, what what's the size uh, opportunity size there how do you see that industry playing out uh, in, in in the near term and then obviously in the long term basis what has also happened in, in the developed markets Sure. So uh, if you look at genomics and other uh, such newer technologies that are coming up, they can be used in multiple different areas, whether it's in screening, whether it's in diagnosis or, or even therapy management. Now, I think the only, the good and the bad thing about genomics so far has been um, the fact that the prices have been coming down of the reagents itself. So there is a possibility, which was one of the limiting factors today for most people using these techniques. Uh, across the world, I think uh, what we have started seeing is that there has been a much more uh, increased adoption of these technologies, primarily in uh, whether it's in disease areas like oncology or neurology, but also in, in areas uh, in fun things like ancestry and, and knowing things about yourself. Uh, so I think there, there has been a huge adoption, um, and it is only going to increase further because I think the, mainly the limitation factors were accessibility and the price point, both of which are coming down tremendously. So what was a few billion dollars is coming down to $100. So you can imagine that the effect that the transistor had on, on our daily uh, telecom and other things, that same sort of disruption can happen in medicine, in genomics, in healthcare. So I think that's the way I look at it, that there is, we haven't yet seen that huge deluge yet because we are not yet at that price point. But I think in the five years that we've been in the, in the market, our prices also have dropped fairly significantly. So I would say in the next two, three years, we'll start seeing a much more uh, huge, we'll, we'll start seeing a lot more adoption of this as the awareness of the consumer increases, but also as uh, the awareness amongst the medical professionals increase. And, and where do you see the uh, adoption first picking up uh, uh, from? So would it, be, would it be within the larger setups uh, like, like a Thyrocare or a Dr. Lal's or, or, or something of that sort? Or would, because they already have the footprint right, to go B2C. Or you see this to play out in a more B2B fashion uh, in the near term and then sort of uh, it finds its way as the price drops further? See, I think the problem with the, many of the pathology labs is that they are very content with the business they get. So it's not, this is not something that is driving their business today. I think it has to, it, you know, currently we are seeing a lot of growth coming direct, uh, but also we do work with a lot of B2B players as well. So while there is a distribution channel, I think the, the teams that are actually going out there to consumers are not, not the same kind that you would need to develop this. 
uh, there are other channels that are more likely to pick this up faster. So I think there is, because this is a very different kind of a sale, there is possibility that you would need someone who understands technology better. You need uh, doctors who understand this space better. So I think the way we've seen it uh, evolve has been there are certain types of doctors, for instance, who will pick this up faster. But in the next five years, as the next set of medical professionals come on board, I think we'll start seeing that there will be a definite increase. But I think the real push will be through insurance, through pharmaceutical, and through other, other such areas. Would this, you know, as preventive diagnostics uh, catches up and becomes the more sort of, uh, uh, the bigger part of growth, uh, uh, as we see in the traditional diagnostic businesses as well. Uh, would this not fit uh, perfectly well into, into, that, uh, into that piece of growth uh, for, for the traditional uh, diagnostics? Or as you, as you plan, out a, plan out a retail uh, sort of or a B2C uh, model, or the price points are still prohibitive uh, to sort of play it on a, uh, play it on a larger scale? No, I think, B, I mean, B2C will do, I mean, but works for a certain extent. Only the problem is in terms of getting to the right volumes right now. Uh, B2B, so we'll continue to work with the path labs to get some of the volumes, but I think ultimately the real volumes won't come from the path labs. That's my, uh, that's my take on it. What do you think on the regulatory side needs to uh, change, like uh, on, the, on, the, on the payer side, on the, on the regulation side, what is it that can sort of help you uh, going forward? There is enough regulatory push now uh, in healthcare. So where do you see that helping you? So I think, you know, if, if they start paying for outcomes, I think that's where molecular diagnosis will, will really help. Because if, let's say, you're paid for keeping a patient well, like they're trying to do in the U.S., I think then the need for technology in increases further. The second thing is, if you want to, you want to understand that uh, prevention is going to be much more cost-effective than, um, you know, than treatment, I think then you'll start seeing that. So I think from a regulatory perspective, uh, I think we are looking at a lot of price control happening, whether it's in stents and other things, which is later on in life. Uh, if we can start seeing that doctors start getting paid for actually keeping patients well, I think you will see a different, uh, you know, completely different way of how they will start looking at technology because they might, if they get paid for that better, I think it'll be, it'll be far superior. The second thing is, I think if insurance industry matures in India, I think you'll see that, um, you know, a lot of growth in the other markets have been driven through that. Um, and that hasn't happened in India. The, the third thing is, I think, from a regulatory perspective, we haven't seen that much emphasis on preventive right now, even though in India our budgets are fairly low. I think our budgets are so low that, you know, even with all the grant plans that we might have, we might not be able to actually uh, implement some of those. So if the focus becomes early stage, I think even for the governments, even for everybody else, I think it becomes a far more... Um, far more convincing argument that you should invest more over there. But from a regulatory perspective, I think we'll have to look at a lot of models outside of India to be able to get to the right kind of uh, model that will work for us. So, uh, you know, as we see a regulatory overhang on, on prices uh, for, for testing, maybe it starts inside hospitals first and moves out later. But w with if, for example, there is some price control, uh, would, would it be best in that case uh, to, to stay B2B uh, rather than go B2C? And maybe... Yeah. The price control will affect the hospitals more than these uh, standalone diagnostic players. Hospitals have got some kind of a comfort of in-house patients and that limits the cap you know, counts. And to make it viable, they have kept higher pricing. Whereas commercial players all have fought in the street and they have all uh, disrupted their own pricing. So when a price control comes, a hospital will have challenges because they don't have volume. And if there is a control, they can't operate it internally. They may have to outsource, which is most likely to happen. Having said that, uh, uh, I have not done pathology. I have not done microbiology. I have done only biochemistry. So I believe that is the strength of uh, today's uh, uh, diagnosis business. Don't do everything, if possible. Don't, even I don't do what Anu does. And we don't, she doesn't do what I do. So if you notice it, uh, 
literally speaking, the one who focuses is making a very powerful journey. I do radiology. There also I don't do ultrasound, MRI or CT. I only do PET CT. And in PET CT, when I am focusing, the machine is having a capability of doing almost 40 scans per machine per day. Currently, there are only five machines. Five scans per machine per day is done. It is almost like everybody is running a private jet. They are not running a commercial airline. So I think I have been telling in various forums, standing machine is a liability. Running machine is an asset. So have machines and keep running them. So that gives a necessity to disrupt the price and make sure the machine runs. The irony in today's pathology industry is the guys who charge more makes less profit. The guys who charge least make most profit. So that's a you know, volume game there. And I believe that it should be playing in. Coming to price control, it will affect uh, many people who have felt that my customer is rich so they can pay me. So, you know, Dr. Velumani, do you, do you in, in, in the uh, near, maybe not in the near term future, but in the longer term, see uh, opportunities to acquire uh, businesses in the genomic space, in the molecular diagnostic space, as th this, you know, one, it adds to the menu, uh, two, it is at a higher price point. So, you know, as you see, uh, you know, price uh, realization growth challenges in the industry, do you think that can add, uh, uh, you know, d mitigate some of the realization growth issues? And, and as the volume piece catches on in, in that part of the business, uh, would that be a, a good inorganic opportunity to look at? Now, the current four or five years have made inorganic acquisitions very costly. Earlier, no one knew what is their value, including me. And then now they are all listed, we know what is multiple all about. So any guy who go and talk, he tells, if you get that multiple, why don't you give me that multiple? So it's going to be tough, unless otherwise, like Dr. G.S.K. Velu, who has got deep pockets and could go ahead and acquire a fairly good number of uh, laboratories. Well, uh, inorganic has its own cost. Probably it helps you to build a size much faster. It all depends upon how you want to journey. I had not in last 23 years done any inorganic acquisition. I don't think uh, I will be doing that. And even if I do that way, it will fit in what kind of uh, integration challenges are there. Is it worth doing in a laboratory business is uh, still a big question. Though all of us are having cash in our balance sheet, today I'm doing a buyback instead of doing an inorganic because it appears that inorganic is not that simple. But having said that, let one, two, three, four guys remain in the industry without uh, any inorganic acquisition. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, if they get together, they can even become number two or number three. So there, there appears to be some necessity. I think regional players should get together. I think the investors who are sitting here must coolly go and purchase some 10 regional laboratories without any knowledge, what are you going to do? And then make it as a single brand and make, uh, get into multiples which are uh, very attractive. I think if you are in a regional operator, multiples are only 10 or 15. You are a national operator, multiples are 20 or 25, even 30. So I think the game is to get size and the investor's job it is. Laboratory people will not understand, will be scared and will be not truly going for it. This is my personal opinion. So l last question, uh, Dr. Velumani. Uh, how do you see the PPP business uh, playing out in, in the diagnostic industry? It's caught on in the last four or five years. Uh, lots of players have sort of built scale just on that model. Uh, how do you see it, one, playing out for yourself, playing out for the industry? There is a perception in the investor community it's not sticky enough, right? So the valuation multiples are not what, you know, players continue to ask the same multiples that... Uh, <clears throat> the non-PPP or the B2C businesses will command. But uh, how do you see that business play out in terms of stickiness, in terms of strength of uh, uh, the margin profile of, of that business? I think pathology doesn't need any PPP because it is a low capex and uh, anybody can get inside as long as they give business. You can sit and operate there. So pathology is much simpler. I think the three areas where we have challenges is uh, CT, MRI, PET-CT. 
I think government has come up uh, with, uh, in various state governments have come up with PPP for CT and MRI. I am told it's working very well. Only thing, cash comes very, very, very late. So that's the biggest challenge. And uh, Indian healthcare is not a, a central government's domain. It's a state government's domain. There are too many uh, challenges in uh, uh, understanding the nuances and getting it. But I believe that CT, MRI, PET CT would be certainly any benefited out of PPP. And once you have got the in-house patients off the hospital, your business becomes profitable and viable. And you don't have to pay that so-called referral fees to get that patient because they're in-house patients. So I think PPP will rule. PPP will be... Government should only promise and pay that uh, dues in time. That is the only fear probably many have got when they get into PPP. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. William Thank you so much, Anu.